Greetings in the name of Yahweh HaMashiach. At the end of today's broadcast, I'll have a mailing address, phone number, and website. Please stay tuned. Greetings in the name of Yahweh, the only name given among men, whereby we must be saved. And we do appreciate each and every one of you who has taken your time tuning in this program. We believe it will be a real blessing to you. We're going to be going over to the book of Psalms 22. The book of Psalms 22 and verse 17. Because we've been talking about the last several weeks about Scripture about the Old Testament, about fulfilling Scripture. And people are so minded of a New Testament that when they open their Bible, all they see is Matthew all the way to the book of Revelations without understanding before there was a New Testament writing and the reason why I say it that way because I understand a lot of people don't understand see when you just use the word New Testament A lot of people don't understand that when you take your Bible, a testament, it takes blood to bring a testament in. In other words, the animals that were killed in the Old Testament, sacrificed, their blood was only a shadow of of the true Messiah or as a Hebrew would call it Mashiach when he would come. So something had to be fulfilled. In other words when you see the shadow of the Old Testament then there was an image and that Mashiach was the image, not the shadow, but the image. But the scripture from Genesis to Malachi was what had revealed the Mashiach, what he would do before he done it. Before he come, just like Isaiah 53. If you read Isaiah 53, and matter of fact, if you go back to Isaiah 52, a little bit back to closer to the end of Isaiah 52, and you read it and come all the way through Isaiah 53, you would find that Isaiah's prophecy was foreshowing foreshowing the suffering of Mashiach before he come. The book of Isaiah written somewhere between 800 to 1,000 years before the Mashiach come. So when you find in Scripture, you find what actually would show forth the New Testament. And people today just want to throw it out. Just throw the Old Testament out. You have to understand what part does not apply to us today. 
But there is parts that still applies. But here in the book of Psalms 22:17, it says, Now, what we're reading here is actually fulfillments of when the Messiah suffered. It says, Psalms 22, 17 says, I may tell all my bones, they look and they stare upon me. 22.18 says, They departed, or they parted my garments among them and cast lots upon my vesture. Now, we find this prophecy being fulfilled in all of the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John. We find a Mashiach that had suffered because of Scripture to fulfill Scripture. And this is what is so important because I have found that people today if you can get them to studying their Bible from Genesis to Malachi, from Malachi to Matthew, Matthew to the book of Revelations. There's no way, once you get a hold of this, there's no way that you could come up with a name such as the name of Jesus that's less are between 250 to 300 years old now. You can figure it up yourself. When it come out in what is known as the 1769 edition. But then when you go back to the 17, or excuse me, the 1611, the name of Jesus is not there. Well, once you begin to understand this, something ought to enlighten you why are we not still teaching and believing the same name that was given to the early assembly? Because the early assembly taught only one name. If you look, matter of fact, if you go to the book of Psalms 22, 22, it's still the same chapter, what fulfilled what spoke about the Messiah, what they would do to him. Here in the book of Psalms 22, 22, where it says, I will declare thy name unto my brethren. In the midst of the congregation will I praise thee. When you look at this and if you continue go to your next verse it says now listen to understand this so this what we just read in 22 and 22 of the book of Psalms is found in the book of Hebrews 2 and 12. 
The only difference is they use the word church instead of congregation. It's the same thing. But it says here, now this is quoting, this was being quoted from Psalms 22, the book of Psalms 22, 22, here in the book of Hebrews 2, 12. It says, saying, I will declare thy name unto my brethren in the midst of of the church will I sing praises or praise unto thee. Now going back real quick to the book of Psalms 22.22 of course the, the word for congregation is the word called kahal. This is also the same word that's used as an assembly or church. But the next verse says, Ye that fear Yahweh, and the King James says, Lord, L-O-R-D, praise Him. Now, what name was He talking about then? in 22 and 22 of the book of Psalms. The next verse tells you, ye that fear Yahweh, King James says Lord, L-O-R-D capital letters here, praise Him, who? Yahweh. All ye the seed of Jacob, glorify Him and fear Him, all ye seed of Israel. Now, I find that people want to take Israel. Now, understand where I'm coming from because I know I deal with this stuff all the time with people. Once you can get people to understand, people are being taught so much false teaching from the scripture so much false teaching from the scripture when the Messiah himself said I come in my father's name then to get people oneness people on top of this to believe that there is one name for the father because most can't come up with a name because if they have a name for the Father and it's different than the Son, then Jesus is not going to fit in there. It's impossible for the name of Jesus to fit in. So when you go back, first of all, when you understand the congregation. The congregation, the scriptures from Genesis to Malachi, was really strictly given to Israel. Now we understand that Israel did not come about in the scripture. Now understand where I'm coming from on this. In the the scripture until Abraham come on the scene. But when you look and how Yahweh took Abraham or Avram brought him out then changed his name to from Avram to Abraham Or as the King James would say, but the King James is really saying exactly how it's said. And we read as being Abram or Abraham. And then he had a son, Isaac, and then Jacob, whose name was changed to Israel. 
And it was a promised seed. It was already given to Abraham. This message of the true Mashiach was given to the prophets of Israel. Were given to the people of Israel. Once you go over to the book of Luke, give you an example. We're going to go this way for just a little bit here. Go to the book of Luke. The book of Luke, the 24th chapter. Here in the book of Luke, in the 47th verse of the book of Luke, this is Luke 24, 47. It says, And that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in His name among all nations. But it goes on and it says, Beginning at Yerushalayim in Jerusalem. Who was the first congregation? It was Israel. The book of Luke says that his name is to be preached among all nations, but begins at Jerusalem. What name is to be preached? To all nations, but it begins at Jerusalem. Now, if you're oneness, you really need to ponder this. Because this verse is showing that ever what name this Mashiach had would have to be preached is going to be preached in Jerusalem beginning in Jerusalem then it's going to go among all nations the same name not different names but you're being talked at you're being talked at you cannot even preach First Timothy. If you go to the book of First Timothy three sixteen, and I know everybody, especially oneness, are real familiar with this. First Timothy three sixteen. It says without controversy. Great is the mystery. It's a Hebrew word called Gadol, great, sowed, secret, or mystery that the Hakasi Dut, meaning godliness, meaning great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifested in flesh. Now, if you're oneness, then you're going to have to acknowledge that this God that he's talking about is not talking about gods, but it's talking about a God. This God where great is the mystery of godliness, this God that was manifested in flesh, if you believe in one true God, 
then you're going to have to believe that this one true God existed before all things. Then you're going to have to understand and be in oneness. You ought to have no problem with what this is really saying about true oneness. This one true God had a name from Genesis to Malachi. But the majority of you oneness, just like with Trinity, has never been taught the real, true, apostolic oneness that was taught to the true apostolic assembly in the beginning. The true apostolic assembly in the beginning is because there's it's impossible to believe in a New Testament without understanding the old without believing the old it's impossible for it it's impossible it is impossible but what we've been taught is this people have tried to take the apostolic assembly that started with Israel the assembly the congregation that started with Israel in the very beginning. When you take the congregation and you study it and you search this out, people today are not really truly understanding that the assembly that was given or let me say it this way that Apostle Peter who had the keys to the kingdom in the beginning the keys that he had taught the name of Yahweh But what people are being taught. People are being taught. That. Nobody knows. The name of God. This is how people are actually being taught. So then what you have. What they're trying to do. And I'm probably going to have to deal with some of this. In the next program. Because I didn't really know I was going this far with it. But I really feel it's a need in this area. People have tried to come up with two, set up two different churches in the beginning. They've tried to take the Gentile church, separate it from the church that Yahweh started, which was Israel, in the beginning on the day of Pentecost. Because the congregation on the day of Pentecost, that 120 were Israeli other than being proselytes. Then if they were proselyte Gentiles, they still had to come through the same plan of salvation. Because the Gentiles don't get it in the beginning. It's given to on to the in Jerusalem first, then in all the earth, all the world, all the nations. This is where it starts. But people today are actually being taught and being taught to separate Israel from the church. And I do believe you separate Israel from the church. But I'm not separating Israel from the church after on the day of Pentecost the Israel that accepted the Mashiach. All of them didn't accept him. I'm talking about Israel that accepted him become the first 
assembly established after the blood of Mashiach was shed. This is what I'm talking about. So they try to take the congregation or the church and separate it from the Gentiles is what is really being taught today. I said it's really what's really truthfully being taught today. Why? Why is this actually being taught? Once, uh, one reason is because if you take the true name according to the book of Matthew sixteen eighteen, when Apostle Peter was given the keys to the kingdom, and he said, "Upon this rock I will build my." Assembly. Of course, King James says church. This same word for church, you can go and check this out. It's the same Hebrew word. can be the word kahal, which is used here. And you can, if you, once you understand that there's no separation between Israel's plan of salvation and the Gentiles. It's the same plan of salvation. Why would the Gentiles have a different plan of salvation than Israel? But it looks like, again, that our time has just about come and gone. And we're going to try to pick this up again next week. People are being taught excuses they say nobody can speak his name, nobody can say his name, nobody can write his name, nobody knows his name. And this is being taught in the church. This kind of stuff's being taught in the church. It's a wake up call, folks. You need to listen. You need to study your Bibles. These denominations, organizations are not going to get you nowhere. In the last broadcast, we were talking about the church, talking about Israel. Does Israel have a different plan of salvation than what the Gentiles do? I said, do Israel have a different plan of salvation than what Israel does? I feel like we have a lot of times people are trying to separate the church and the Gentile church as separate. And this is one reason I want to read here in the book of Acts 738. Because I believe we have to understand first how things are being taught. Over in the book of Acts, 738, it reads, This is He. Now, first of all, if we're going to understand the He here, then we, have, we would have to understand the verses before this. And we understand that Israel was in the wilderness for 40 years. There was a creator of heaven and earth that brought them out of Egypt into the wilderness. And when they were leaving Egypt, he rolled back the Red Sea. And before they left Egypt, they had the Passover, the Passock. Of course, everything 
was a shadow of what would take place. But we find Israel wandered in the wilderness for 40 years where it looked like after they had only been in there for a couple of years they had their chance to go into the promised land but because of unbelief Yahweh took all them that was from 19 years down they would go in and look like from 20 years up they would die in the wilderness So if you backed up a little bit here in the book of Acts and start reading, it would explain a whole lot more. But right now, I just want to deal with this is this is that Moses, which unto the children of Israel a prophet. Now, this is 37th verse. This is 37th verse, right before 38. But instead of reading a whole bunch of it, but 738 says, This is that Moses which said unto the children of Israel, A prophet shall, of course, King James says, The Lord your God shall raise unto you of your brethren, like unto me, talking about Moses. Now, unto your brethren, like unto me, him ye hear. Now, real quick, if we go back to where this is said in the book of Acts 7.37. This is actually quoted in the book of Deuteronomy. 18.15 it says. This Deuteronomy 18.15. Remember, this is in the book of Acts written. The book of Deuteronomy was before the book of Acts. The book of Acts is just like all the rest of the New Testament writings. It's based on something. It has a foundation. The foundation for a written New Testament is based on Scripture from Genesis to Malachi. Right here, in Deuteronomy 18.15, it says, I'm going to read how King James says at first. It says, The Lord thy God will raise up a prophet, or raise up unto thee a prophet, from the midst of thee, of thine, or of thy brethren, like unto me. Unto him ye shall hearken. Now, we're going to have to understand, does the Gentile assembly, is the Gentile assembly believing in a different creator than what Israel was given in the wilderness. And why I'm saying that is because of this. Once you understand that the writing of the New Testament has a foundation, you need to say to yourself, when you listen to this broadcast, the New Testament has a foundation. And the foundation is from Genesis to Malachi. I wonder if some people are not scared to say this. Because once you understand 
and are willing to accept what is from Genesis to Malachi, then there's no there's not going to be no contradictory in the New Testament with the Old Testament. Then when you use the word Old Testament, you have to understand if if we do it correct and we understand the word Old Testament is really the Hebrew word called the Old Testament is something that man put on there. It's a Hebrew word called Dom Berit. This is what is known as the covenant. You can go to the 8th chapter, or excuse me, to the 24th chapter, to the 8th verse in the book of Exodus, and find this to be true. You can go to the book of Hebrews around the ninth chapter and this confirms this because the writer of Hebrews is showing where the Old Testament come in at and it takes it from Exodus 24th chapter around the 8th verse. So when you use the word for as being Old Testament. Then you have to understand that when you're dealing with this, there's a whole lot to it. But we're not being taught this. We're being taught opposite. We're really being taught anti-Old Testament. Basically. Basically. We're being taught anti-name against the name that was given for the plan of salvation. This is basically what we're being taught today in churches. Now, I'm not saying every church. I'm saying that when a man walks, sees something, and throws it out the window, this man's going to stand before Yahweh. You'll only know what you've been told. People today only knows what they've been told. Preachers today only preach what they've been told. So, once you begin to look at this, and you understand, see, what is so critical about this, you have Gentiles being saved in what we call a New Testament. And to understand that New Testament, in Hebrew, it's known as Dam Habarit Hakadasha, which means the New Blood Covenant. Now, your King James Bible, if you go over to the book of Matthew, the 26th chapter, the 28th verse, talks about this. How the Mashiach would shed his blood Why would he shed his blood and we be still in the Old Testament? You couldn't. You wouldn't be. Why would that blood of the Mashiach that would be shed and this blood is going to, is this message is first has got to be preached to Israel according to the book of Luke 24-47. Then it would be preached into all the world. Into all nations. So to understand this, see, a lot of times we're just taking 
things and just and believe in things, we find this. Once you understand that what a testament is, a testament has blood involved with it. That's what a testament is. It is a covenant. But it takes blood for this covenant. I said it takes blood for this testament, uh, for this covenant. So then, once we understand this, that you're either under the blood of what we understand as the Old Testament, or you're under the blood that brought in the New Testament. This is what happened with Israel. When the Mashiach died, they kept believing that they lived under the Old Testament. Today, the very right now, when you're listening to this broadcast, Israel, let's use Israel for an example that's over there in the Middle East. In Jerusalem, Israel. We know the prophecies for Israel in Jerusalem in the future. We understand that one day this creator of heaven and earth, this Mashiach, is going to come again and his feet are going to set on the Mount of Olives. Then they go acknowledge who he is. But they've been they have been spiritually in darkness. They're spiritually in darkness. They don't see the blood of a Mashiach, a human being, a virgin-born human being, bringing in a New Testament. They're still living, living under the Old Covenant, or, as the King James would say, Old Testament. But why would Israel just because Israel does not believe in a Mashiach doesn't make that the Mashiach has not come. Just because they don't believe it that don't that still does not make it that the Mashiach has not come. This Messiah has come. Israel, according to Second Corinthians three fourteen, it says, But their minds were blinded. For until this day, now this day was at the time, and it's still this day that we're living in right now. But when this book of Second Corinthians was written, the writer of this book was bringing out and showing that at that time, that Israel, Corinthians, you look at it this way that Corinthians is at, at the particular time of Corinthians matter of fact 2 Corinthians was written roughly around 58 to 60 AD so at this particular time 
they were acknowledging, even at that time, the writer of this book, who was supposed to be Paul, was acknowledging, acknowledging that the reading of the Old Testament, there's a veil is done away with in Mashiach. But when Israel reads it, but their minds were blinded for until this day remaineth the same veil. In other words, the veil that was put over Moses' face would be like a veil put over the children of Israel's face. Remaineth this day the same veil untaken away in the reading of the Old Testament. Which veil is done away with in Mashiach? But they don't see it that way. They don't understand it that way. That veil is still on their face to this day. And the reason why I'm saying this is because there is so much teaching on this by trying to separate the Gentiles being different than Israel. Remember 1 Corinthians and 2 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians was written between 55 to 59 A.D. 2 Corinthians was written somewhere between 58 to 60 A.D. This is all give or take one way or the other. Once we can understand, when we understand about a covenant, a covenant, see, people are trying to give the Gentile church a different plan of salvation through a name than what Israel had. When you wind up with Jesus that is pushing to be 300 years old. So it's really between 250 and 300 years old. When you look at this and you and you examine this, here you have People living today and hour we're living in right now, right now, has totally got a different plan of salvation through names, and they don't. And the church today doesn't even know who the Father's name is. And then when they do, they still separate the Father and Son. as two different names. Now you can't have this in true apostolic assembly. You cannot have this kind of teaching. I said you cannot have this kind of teaching. Let me give you an example. If you go to like the Revised Standard Version where the King James will use the word Old Testament, you will find the where it reads instead of Old Testament, it will say Old Covenant. If you go to several translations, you will find where it will use the word instead of Old Covenant, it will say Old, uh, Old Testament it is say Old Covenant so once you can understand your covenant do the Gentiles have a different covenant with a name than what the early assembly had that Peter gave on the day of Pentecost Peter who had the keys to the kingdom And here in 2 Corinthians 
on Israel even at that time. Now, not all of them at the particular time. If we go back and understand that, keep this in mind, Israel overall, keep this in mind. Real quick, let's go over to the book of Acts. Let's go to the book of Acts real quick. The book of Acts. 2. Acts 2. And 1. The Bible says, And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. Now first of all, if you understand what Pentecost was, Pentecost in Hebrew, is known as Shavuot. Actually, it means weeks. And it's the weeks of seven. Seven weeks is 49 days. The next day is 50th day. This is what the day of Pentecost was called. The 50th day when the Holy Spirit was poured out on the day of Pentecost nearly 2,000 years ago. Then when we can understand this, who was there on the day of Pentecost? Who was there? We understand that they were Proselytes also, that means could be Gentiles. Strangers, in other words. Gentiles. But they were believing the same thing Israel had. And Israel were, was believing. Just overall, according to the book of Luke, go real quick over to the book of Luke, 24, 47. Luke 24, 47. And this is what it says. And that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in His name among all nations beginning at Jerusalem. First of all, if you go back and read this, you're going to understand that the Mashiach, this is talking about the Mashiach, His name. Now, the Mashiach, according to Matthew twenty-eight nineteen, where it says, "Baptize in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit." King James says, "Holy Ghost." A name in A M E. So we can go back and look. The Father and Son cannot have two separate names. Peter was the man that had the keys to the kingdom that would understand Matthew 28, 19. Peter was given the keys to the kingdom according to the 16th chapter of the book of Matthew. Now, Peter's message didn't go to the Gentiles at first. And this is, this is what we're talking about here in the book of Acts where we was reading. In Acts 7, 38, where it's talked about, this is he that was in the church in the wilderness with the angel that spake to him in Mount Sinai and with our fathers who received lively oracles to give unto us. Now, we had read 737 about a prophet in the book of Acts. But remember, Luke was talking about given that the assembly would stand on the day of Pentecost and it would start in Jerusalem first. And we were talking about 
in the last broadcast about the church in the wilderness. Of course, we want to start in verse 37 real quick. So in the book of Acts, the second, the seventh chapter, the 37th verse, and I would like to say this, the book of Acts itself, according to history, the book of Acts was written somewhere between 63 to 64, give or take. What I've done, I've went through different timings or dates of different ones that has tried to prove the dates of the books of the New Testament. So, and I didn't just go through one, I went through several. So I've found maybe they would vary a little here or there. So you, a lot of times you'll hear me say maybe like the book of Acts written between 63, 64. Some of them will say between maybe 61 and let's say 64. Just one way or the other, give or take, but we understand that the book of Acts was not written at the time when the Mashiach established an assembly on the day of Pentecost. And what we was talking about in the last broadcast was the church. How many different churches are there? Now we've got a lot of religion But what is the true church? I'm not talking about religions. I'm talking about a body that belongs to the Mashiach. Here in the book of Acts 7.37 it says, This is that Moses which said unto the children of Israel." A prophet shall the Lord your God now I'm reading how the King James reads which would really be in Hebrew known would be Yahweh your Elohim and the word Elohim would be the word for God matter of fact if you really go over to the book of Deuteronomy, and we'll do that, this again here in just a few minutes. Just to go over this, just to be sure, because what we're dealing with, we're dealing with the Word. I'm not doing these broadcasts trying to say something the Word don't say. We get a lot of calls from people. The majority of the calls you would think would be negative. But the majority of the calls are positive. We have people that calls that has believed in Jesus' name for years. And they hear this broadcast and they start studying. And they're thankful that somebody's willing to to tell the truth. Because there was an assembly nearly 2,000 years ago that was established on truth. Not mixed up in doctrines that's mixed up today. With the same plan of salvation both for Israel and the Gentiles. And it has not changed. Man gets in with his traditions.
But either way, let me go ahead and read this here in Acts 737. It goes on, it says, A prophet shall the Lord your God, I'm reading how the King James says, raise up unto you of your brethren like unto me, him shall you hear. Go over real quick, if you can, to the book of Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy, the 18th chapter. Deuteronomy, the 18th chapter and verse 15. That's Deuteronomy 18.15. Now, in the book of Acts, this is being quoted from Deuteronomy 8.15. This is not being quoted from Acts. It is now because we've got it written. But before a writing of the book of Acts, they were referring to Deuteronomy 18.15. But today, we have both the book of Acts and Deuteronomy. But at this particular time, the book of Acts was in the making. So, in the book of Acts, or excuse me, in the book of Deuteronomy, 18.15, it says, I'm reading again from a red letter edition King James Bible Old Testament. It says, The Lord thy God shall rise or raise up unto thee a prophet from the midst of thee of thy brethren like unto me. Unto him ye shall hearken. Now, I'm just about sure Unless you are against the Mashiach, you would have to agree that this is talking about the Mashiach. Here in Deuteronomy 18.15. Now, Deuteronomy 18.15 says, where it uses the word the Lord thy God. It's a Hebrew word. Look at the word Lord. If you've been listening to this broadcast for any time, you understand the word L-O-R-D, capital letters, is a cover-up. And the true name of Yahweh would be here. Check this out for yourself and you'll see. Of course, in the Hebrew Scripts, from where the King James Bible is translated from in the Old Testament and quoted in the New Testament would have to be quoting the same identical thing in both in both Old and New using the name of Yahweh. And it does. Because in the Hebrew Scripture it uses Yahweh, Elohe. Here, it uses the word Elohecha, which means thy God. Yahweh, thy God. Now, once you understand this, once you understand this, and you think about this, here we have in the book of Acts this is being quoted I said this is being quoted in the book of Acts now if this is being quoted in the book of Acts then what is really going on and what's really being hid. Why is it that people today say and being taught in churches 
They're trying to separate the Gentiles and Israel and as having two different names for the same Savior. Or are they? When you really start searching and you find that the early assembly and from Genesis to Malachi actually taught that there was one true God and that one true creator had a name and Yahweh established his name with Israel and then had all the prophets from Genesis to Malachi giving witness of this name. Also, the assembly that is in the day and hour we're in right now as you listen to this broadcast is being taught totally against all of this. It's a shame, but in the churches today, most people does not even know from Genesis to Malachi when they see the word Lord, capital letters, God, capital letters, and the word Jehovah used seven times, that it is supposed to be the name of God, but it's been replaced. And how has all of this taken place? And you that's sitting in churches, and you that's sitting in the Pentecostal churches, Acts 2.38 believers, you're letting, your, you're letting your denominations and your traditions and your doctrines and your organizations bind you into a tradition that you can't be free because you, you, know, because you don't know the truth. You're only going to go as far as that denomination, that organization will let you go. And as far as you're going. Because these denominations and organizations are going back to its mother. Because the very foundation of these churches today and these oneness apostolic Pentecostal churches, their mother established them near at 325 A.D. and they don't even know it. And it's a it's it's time. It's a wake-up call. Why do you think that this broadcast and you're listening to it, it's a wake-up call for the churches today, for the assembly. Not for denominations, organizations, but for the people that are caught in this kind of stuff. People that are locked down into traditions and doctrines of men and the church ought to know the name of their God and they don't know it. Until you can understand the name of God in the old, you're never going to understand who the Mashiach is. But the oneness are trying to build a oneness doctrine without the name, without the true name. It's impossible. And Moses, this is quoted in Acts 7.37 and it talks about the Lord your God in 7.37. Same thing that was quoted in the 18th chapter of the book of Deuteronomy, 1815, here in the book of Acts, 737. And let me tell you something. There is, and I've been saying this, I've been saying it over and over. I have a book of one of the biggest oneness, Pentecostal, 
Jesus name Acts 238 denominations that was supposed to have been established somewhere roughly I think maybe at the end in the 30s or the 40s these this one particular denomination organization has got a book out by some of its head men and this is the problem when men controls the word that's as far how how does all this take place what man has the authority to control the word to control the word to control the people They have a book out. And I have the book. It's called In the Name of Jesus. In this book. This man writes. That no one was ever baptized. In the name of Yahweh. Now he uses the word Yahweh. In his book. And people fail for this. He's telling you. That nobody was ever baptized in the name of Yahweh or as he would say Yahweh. Once I began to look at this book and I seen this, I thought, my, did this man ever do any studying? They're supposed to believe Deuteronomy 6 and 4. Check Deuteronomy 6 and 4 out. It has the name of Yahweh twice. But one of the excuses today is this. See, if they come to the terms that the Bible's right, then that denomination's going to have to say, hey, look, we're wrong. And we've been wrong. And I can tell you right now, it is wrong. These oneness organizations are not building on the foundation of Acts 2.38 as was established nearly 2,000 years ago and not really only established 2,000 years ago but the plan was given from Genesis to Malachi thousands of years before this. And people's caught up in this stuff. But the truth is going to stand. This is why there's really none of them can do anything with this broadcast. We will, we get on every station that we're on. Ever what station you're listening to. We will, we, we are willing to sit down, come anywhere, and teach this to anyone, anybody, anybody in any body, this truth. Any oneness. It's a wake up call, folks. It's a time to shake yourself. It's a time to 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 start questioning your denomination, your organization. Because the truth's going to stand. Traditions of men are coming down. It's amazing that the oneness never thought that they would be challenged. The oneness people, the oneness Acts 2, 38, 38 doctrine has been the one that's supposed to be in leadership. And it was the one that was supposed to be doing all the challenging. But Yahweh Almighty has raised up a truth nearly 2,000 years ago that challenges this false teaching of any name can be used. It's challenging this Acts 2.38 baptized in Jesus' name is what it's doing. 
It's a challenge to the oneness. This is a challenge to your big denominations and your big organizations. They've been trying to challenge the Trinity all these years. And now there's a message coming forth. And it's been here the whole time. It's just been overlooked because of traditions and doctrines of men that have made the word of Yahweh an effect. But the teaching today, and I've said this over and over and over and over, they're teaching that nobody knows the name of God. In other words, what they're telling you is nobody knows the name of your Savior. Nobody can say it. Nobody can write it. It's been lost. This is really what's being taught. This is what is being taught. True apostolic oneness can't have all these names. Everywhere. You take your King James Bible. The way it was translated. It was doing all that it could to produce one God with one name. But tradition come in and has taken and interpreted the word of Yahweh is what it's done. I said it has come in and interpreted the word of Yahweh. Now, if you really look at this and understand how the traditions and doctrines of men have literally, literally, organization, denomination, tries to interpret and what they've done, they twisted the scripture and people's failed for it. Honest, sincere people have failed for it. And honest, sincere ministers have failed for this. When you go over to the book of Second Peter, one in twenty and you understand what this is saying. 120 says, knowing this first. And this is Second Peter 1 and 20. Knowing this first, that no prophecy of the Scripture is of any private interpretation. That means your denominations and your organizations need to quit trying to interpret it. It's not given to private interpretation. This, this, this says, knowing first, knowing this first, that no prophecy of the Scripture is of any private interpretation. Now, if you really, first, you've got to understand what he is talking about for is scripture. The scripture is from Genesis to Malachi. This is Second Peter. The second chapter. And what is really if you if you look at this, people are throwing their own interpretations on the word of Yahweh is what they're doing today. This is why we're this is what's happened today. I said this is this is actually what has happened today, the day and hour that we're living in. You've got man coming in and trying to put in what he wants it to be and not what the Word of Yahweh says. I said, and not what the Word of Yahweh says. 
once you can understand this, now listen, you, you study this out. Second Peter one twenty. Second Peter one and twenty. Search it out real close. One translation says this. First of all, you must understand this, that no prophecy of Scripture is a matter of one's own interpretation. That was one translation. Let me read you one. It's by the Darby version. Knowing this first, that the scope of no prophecy of the Scripture is had from its own no prophecy of the scripture is had from its own peculiar interpretation. Another one from the Bible Basics. Being conscious in this first place that no man by himself may give a special sense to the words of the prophets. That's a good translation. Here's another translation by Young's. This first, this first knowing that no prophecy of the writings doeth come of private exposure. In other words, keep your private interpretations out. Basically, it's really what this is saying. Look at the day and hour we're living in and it looks like that our time is coming gone and we will pick this back up in the next broadcast. Shalom. We love y'all. Shalom. The mailing address for Yahweh Ministries is 775 McDonald Road, Covington, Georgia 30014 USA. 775 McDonald Road, Covington, Georgia 30014 USA. Be sure and ask about the Father's Name CD and the free literature. Phone 770-784-0703, 770-784-0703. Our website is yahwaministries.org. That's y-a-h-w-a-h hyphen ministries dot o-r-g. y-a-h-w-a-h hyphen ministries dot o-r-g. Until next time. We bid you Shalom.